Hello. This video is going to be me interpreting the book of John, the Gospel part. Because I think it's not looked at enough. Um, we talk about the Bible, you know, a collection of many books going back thousands of years and we have the New Testament this man that they call Jesus and just let me say I'll be saying Yeshua but it's not fully understood and that is why <clears throat> his words aren't quoted so much and in fact Christians will most often quote Paul and um, I take part in a theology forum and there often the argument is you know why give so much credence to Paul and people will argue things like the Trinity and the stuff that Paul said sort of brought it to the Gentiles and they'll say so many things but we're kind of avoid a lot of the times the things that Yeshua said because they don't understand them. Okay, so we're gonna go with John 1.1 1, 1. When all things began the Word already was. The Word dwelt with God and what God was the Word was. The Word then was with God at the beginning and through him all things came to be. <laughs> so, um, a lot of people here then say that the word is the son, the man who died on the cross, Yeshua. But the word, that doesn't make sense because then how can the son be there at the beginning with the father? That's, you know, the fact that you call something a son and something a father means that the father begot the son so must have been there before the word is actually truth when all things began the truth already was the truth dwelt with God and what God was the truth was the truth then was with God at the beginning and through him all things came to be no thing, single thing was created without him. All that came to be was alive with his life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines on in the dark, and the darkness has never mastered it. So that's our, our God, our Father. Sorry about the sniffing. There appeared a man named John, sent from God. He came as a witness to testify to the light that all might become believers through him. He was not himself the light. He came to bear witness to the light, the real light which enlightens every man was even then coming into the world. He was in the world, but the world, though it owed him its being to him, did not recognise him. He entered his own realm, and his own would not receive him. But to all who did receive him, to all who have yielded him their allegiance, he gave the right to become children of God, not born by any human stock or by the fleshly desire of, the, of a human father, but the offspring of God himself. So the word became flesh. He came to dwell among us, and he saw his glory, such glory as befits the Father's only Son of grace and truth. Now that there is is somebody's opinion 2,000 years ago. So really I, I want to be focusing on the things that Yeshua said so I am actually going to um, skip through the first of John quite quickly. Here is John's testimony to him. He cried aloud, This is the man I meant when I said, He comes after me but takes rank before me. For before I was born, he already was. Out of his full store we have all received grace upon grace. For while the law was given through Moses, 
grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God's only Son. He who is nearest to the Father's heart, he has made him known. Now I'll just state here, this is one of the first places in the Bible where you actually get the words Jesus and Christ put together like this. And there's an there's an issue here because it doesn't it doesn't actually make sense, and it is the correct if we put an apostrophe after Jesus, so Jesus is Christ, because Jesus is the name of our mother and father God. There's a name we can call on. There's power in that name. Jesus is Christ. That's what we should be saying instead of Jesus Christ. So then we'll be saying Jesus is Christ, we're talking about the Christ on the earth at that time 2,000 years ago. This is the testimony which John gave when the Jews of Jerusalem sent a deputation of priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He confessed without reserve and avowed, I am not the Messiah. What then are you, Elijah? No, he replied. Are you the prophet we await? He answered, no. Then who are you? They asked. We must give an account to those who sent us. What account do you give of yourself? He answered in the words of the prophet Isaiah. I am a voice crying aloud in the wilderness. Make the Lord's highway straight. Some Pharisees who were in the deputation asked him, if you are not the Messiah or Elijah, nor the prophet, why then are you baptizing? I baptize in water, John replied, but among you, though you do not know him, stands the one who is to come after me. I am not good enough to unfasten his shoes. This took place at Bethany beyond Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Yeshua coming towards him. Look, he said, there is the Lamb of God. It is he who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I spoke when I said, After me a man who is coming, who takes rank before me. For before I was born he already was. I myself did not know who he was. But the very reason why I came baptizing in water was that he might be revealed to Israel. John testified further. I saw the Spirit coming down from heaven like a dove and resting upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptise in water had told me, When you see the Spirit coming down upon someone and resting upon him, you will know that this is he who is to baptise in Holy Spirit. I saw it myself, and I have borne witness, this is God's chosen one. <laughs> the next day again John was standing with two of his disciples when Jesus passed by. John looked towards him and said, there is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and follow Yeshua. When he turned and saw them following him, he asked, What are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, which means a teacher. Where are you staying? Come and see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent the rest of the day with him. It was then about four in the afternoon. One of the two who followed Yeshua after hearing what John said was Andrew. Simon Peter's brother. The first thing he did was to find his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is the Hebrew for Christ. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, of son of John. You shall be called Cephas, that is Peter the rock. The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He met Philip, who like Andrew and Peter came from Bethsaida and said to him, Follow me. Philip went to find Nathanael and told him, We have met a man spoken of by Moses in the law, and, to the, and by the prophets. It is Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nazareth, Nathanael exclaimed. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said, Come and see. When Yeshua saw Nathanael come in, he said, Here is an Israelite worthy of the name. There is nothing false in him. Nathanael asked him, How do you come to know me? Yeshua replied, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip spoke to you. Rabbi, said Nathanael, 
You are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Yeshua answered, Is this the ground of your faith, that I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You shall see greater things than that. Then he added, In truth, in very truth, I tell you all, you shall see heaven wide open, and God's angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. <coughs> now, if you're reading this thinking that Yeshua is the only begotten Son of God, you're going to interpret it differently than if you're reading that here is a man and there's more men involved, there's John as well. So together what's happening here is they're, they're, they're raising their vibe. You know, John saw something which made him believe in that guy. John believing in that guy has given that guy, you know, something as well. And that guy does know God, does know God in his heart. You know, he has got to that stage. But what we're going to see as we're going through this is how that vibe increases and increases and increases and makes more things possible. Like he just said then, you know, he had noticed him sitting under the fig tree, right? So he'd looked at him, he'd been studying him, he was feeling him, right? And he just said, you know, wow, if if that's if that's all it took to give you some faith, you know, to make him start feeling, yes, this is good, something's happening. And, you know, and you're going to see greater things than this. And that, in a sense there, he's having a bit of a prof prophet moment. He's feeling this is right, you know there are going to be bigger things happening. On the third day there was a wedding at Canaan, Canaan, Cana in Galilee. The mother of Yeshua was there, and Yeshua and his disciples were guests also. The wine gave out, so Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine left, he answered. Your concern, mother, is not mine. Your hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. There were six stone water jars standing near, of the kind used for Jewish rites of purification. Now that's a good point there, because it's probable that this wine wasn't the wine that we think about with crushed grapes. That this wine was something um, they did back then a lot, which is involved cannabis. It was uh, cannabis anointing oils, they would smoke cannabis, they would burn it as incense, and they would also make a wine of it. So, the kind used for Jewish rites of purification, that's, that's basically anointing oil, what they call cannabosum. Each held from 20 to 30 gallons. Yeshua said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. Now draw some off, he ordered and take it into the steward of the feast. And they did so. The steward tasted the water now turned into wine, not knowing its source, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He hailed the bridegroom and said, Everyone serves the best wine first, and waits until the guests have drunk freely before serving the poorer sort. But you have kept the best wine till now. So Yeshua made good cannabis wine. This deed at Cana in Galilee is the first of the signs by which Yeshua revealed his glory and led his disciples to believe in him. I mean, after those people who perhaps weren't usually drinking the sort of stuff that you, Jewish, Jewish rites of purification, you know, they might have had a high old time and that could have been quite a night. After this, he went down to Cap Capernaum in company with his mother, his brothers and his disciples. But they did not stay there long, as it was near the time of the Jewish Passover. Yeshua went up to Jerusalem. There he found in the temple the dealers in cattle, sheep and pigeons, and the money changers seated at their tables. Yeshua made a whip of cords and drove them out of, his tem of the temple. Sheep, cattle and all, he upset the tables of the money changers, scattered their coins, 
Then he turned on the dealers in pigeons. Take them out, he said. You must not turn my father's house into a market. His disciples record the words of the scripture. Zeal for thy house will destroy me. The Jews challenged Yeshua. What sign, they asked. Can you show us authority for your action? Destroy this temple, Yeshua replied, and in three days I will raise it again. So one of the points here is, it's what I mean about his gradual sort of increase in, um, say, power, but, you know, vibe and love and highness. So at this point here, he's he's lost his, I mean, he doesn't say here he's lost his temper, but in a sense to be able to drive everything out of a, a room, you'd have to be pretty bullshy, you'd have to be pretty, anyway... No, don't need to labour on that. And there he just makes another prophecy about his own body. They said it has taken 46 years to build this temple. Are you going to raise it again in three days? So they just thought, this guy's crazy, right? Not making sense. But the temple he was speaking of was his body. After his resurrection, his disciples recalled what he had said and they believed the scripture and the words that Yeshua had spoken. So we see here also, I just make the point, that this is also written after the fact, you know. So this is this writing here, John, is, is written after all the events. It's a recollection. So at the beginning when he was saying what he was saying, you know, it was, this is the, the sense that he's come to. <coughs> or at least the translator. While he was in Jerusalem for Passover, many gave their allegiance to him when they saw the signs that he performed. But Yeshua, for his part, would not trust himself to them. He knew men so well, all of them, that he needed no evidence from others about a man, for he himself could tell what was in a man. And that ability comes from feeling. Yeah, I can feel into people's souls. I can do that. And other people can do that. There was one of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish council, who came to Jesus, Yeshua by night. Rabbi, he said, we know that you are a teacher sent by God. No one could perform these signs of yours unless God were with him. Yeshua answered, in truth, in very truth, I tell you, unless a man has been born over again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But how is that possible, said Nicodemus, for a man to be born when he is old? Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Yeshua answered, In truth, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born from water and spirit. Flesh can be give birth only to flesh. It is spirit that gives birth to spirit. So this is, you know, if you have a born again moment, people have done, I have done, you know, it's, it's very true, you know, just, it's a completely new thing that happens to you. And you are permanently changed after that is a nude <laughs> you ought not to be I mean some things you, you've got to experience you ought not to be astonished then when I tell you that you must be born over again the wind blows where it wills you hear the sound of it but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going so with everyone who is born from spirit that's what I just said <laughs> Nicodemus replied, How is this possible? What? said Yeshua. Is this famous teacher of Israel ignorant of such things? In very truth I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, and yet you all reject our testimony. If you disbelieve me when I talk to you about things on earth, how are you to believe if I should talk about the things of heaven? No one ever went up into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, 
The Son of Man, whose home is in heaven. This Son of Man must be lifted up as the serpent was lifted up by Moses in the wilderness, so that everyone who has faith in him may in him possess eternal life. So is that Yeshua's words? It's in quotes. Let me just read that again. No one ever went up into heaven except the one who came down from heaven. So, I think about heaven as where our soul resides. Like, that's, our, that's what you possess. That's your only possession. It's you. You are your only possession. And you reside... You have a place, your soul, in heaven. That's that's what I feel when he's talking about heaven. So, no one can go into heaven who hasn't come from heaven. So if there was something out there that didn't have a soul, then they'll never get a soul. All of us, all of us humans, we all have a soul. So we all came from heaven. We all, we all have that place in heaven. Now, knowing it while you're existing in this physical life, that's another matter. Because that's when you become the possessor of it. You can't possess something you don't know you've got. And I guess just existing as souls when we're not in a life and we're just in God and that's where we've been for a long, long time. And then we come down and have a life and learn stuff. It's only now that we're becoming aware of what we are. And 2,000 years ago, Yeshua knew. And he was probably the first one in history who actually knew. Had, had sort of worked it out to some point so that he was existing with that reality in a physical life. <clears throat> no one ever went up into heaven except those who came down from heaven. The son of man whose home is in heaven. So we could, I could then now into, and obviously I, I might be thinking of new things as I'm reading this to you. Um, and this is a, a good one because I've always wanted what, son of man, what's it on about? Son of man whose home is in heaven. So that's, that's the soul, that's everybody. But at the moment, he's the only one on the planet who has brought that understanding into a, a real life, if you like. Because that's the real test. I think when we're in the spirit world, after we die and before we're preparing for our next life, we're, we're kind of so much in God's hands. We, we can do no wrong. So... You know, we can we can know all the answers in that state, but until we've kind of worked it out and learnt it for ourselves, which is what you have to do in the physical life, no one can just give it to you. You have to. You have to get it for yourself. That's the whole point. Because that's when you properly understand it. This son of man, so then he specifies, so he's saying himself, this son of man must be lifted up as the serpent was lifted up by Moses in the wilderness so that everyone who has faith in him may in him possess eternal life. So I, I don't actually get that bit and I'm, so I'm not going to try and work it out because so that's one thing I'm going to skip over because... I haven't got time to look and think about the serpent of Moses, this, but that's something that's come to me. Anyway, it sounds a bit, do you know what I mean? This is why it's worth... 
aren't um, quoted so much. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, that everyone who has faith in him may not die but have eternal life. It was not to judge the world that God sent his son into the world, but through him the world might be saved. This is in quotes as well. So I'm not... I'm not 100, it sounds a bit like it might be John, John's quotes here, that's, so I'm thinking the first part of that, no one ever went up to heaven except the one that came down from heaven, you know, that might be something he said, and then this, this has gone into a bit of an interpretation, that's my feeling here, but, absolutely, you know, God, you know, God has God gave uh, the earth to man, and you know, basically said, "Do what you want." Um, maybe gave some guidance. I think at some point in history, we we had ambassadors of God on the planet, like God's helpers. You can create any creatures he she wants, but we told them to get lost. We didn't want them. Um, but yeah, so every now and then, God needs to send a vessel that it can use to help bring people to be saved, to know that they're saved. The man who puts his faith in him does not come under judgment, but the unbeliever has already been judged in that he has not given his allegiance to God's only Son. Here lies the test. The light has come into the world, but men prefer darkness to light, because their deeds were evil. Bad men all hate the light and avoid it, for fear their practices should be shown up. The honest man comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that God is in all he does. That's good. After this, Yeshua went into Judea with his disciples, stayed there with them and baptised. John too was baptised in Aenon, near to Salim, because water was plentiful in that region, and people were constantly coming for baptism. This was before John's imprisonment. Some of John's disciples had fallen into dispute with Jews about purification, so they came to him and said, Rabbi, there was a man with you on the other side of the Jordan, to whom you bore witness. Here he is, baptising, and crowds are flocking to him. John's answer was, A man can have only what God gives him. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah. I have been sent as his forerunner. It is the bridegroom to whom the bride belongs. The bridegroom's friend, who stands by and listens to him, is overjoyed at hearing the bridegroom's voice. This joy, this perfect joy, is now mine. As he grows greater, I must grow less. <clears throat> he who comes from above is above all others. He who is from the earth belongs to the earth and uses earthly speech. He who comes from heaven bears witness to what, has been, what he has seen and heard. So, having experienced stuff on the soul level, you can then try and explain that to people. You know, which is what I've been doing for ages. And, but, you know, it's difficult. And you can't prove that they've seen these things. Yet no one accepts his witness. To accept his witness is to attest that God speaks the truth. For he for he whom God and so when when I speak to God it's through feelings. I get feelings from God, so all the time my my faith has been building because the feelings that I'm getting prove to be true. The feelings prove true. I, anything I hear in my soul from God is God speaking and it's truth. So, 
For he whom God sends utters, for he whom God sent utters, utters the words of God. So measureless is God's gift of the Spirit. The Father loves the Son, and he has entrusted him with all authority. He who puts his faith in the Son has hold of eternal life, but he who disobeys the Son shall not see that life. God's wrath rests upon him. So, in my mind here, basically what he's, he's saying no more than the fact that, you know, the son bears true testimony to the father. So you're getting, you're getting the truth through the, the son in this instance. And they're just, you know, like I say, it's written afterwards, it's, it's written for humanity at that time and in the future. A report now reached the Pharisees. Yeshua is winning and baptising more disciples than John. Although in fact it was only the disciples who were baptising and not Yeshua himself. When Yeshua learned this, he left Judea and set out once more for Galilee. That's quite interesting that Yeshua wasn't doing the baptising, only the disciples. He had to pass through Samaria, and on his way he came to a Samaritan town called Sikar, near the plot of ground which Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and the spring called Jacob's Well. It was about noon, and Yeshua, tired after his journey, sat down by the well. The disciples had gone away to the town to buy food. Meanwhile, a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Yeshua said to her, Give me a drink. The Samaritan woman said, What? You? A Jew? Ask a drink of me? A Samaritan woman? Jews and Samaritans, it should be noted, do not use vessels in common. So they don't use the same cup. I'm worried about germs. Yeshua answered her, If only you knew what God gives and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have no bucket, and this well is deep. How can you give me living water? Are you a greater man than Jacob, our ancestor, who gave us the well and drank it, drank from it himself? He and his sons and his cattle too? Yeshua said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I shall give him will never suffer thirst any more. The water that I shall give him will be an inner spring, always welling up for eternal life. <clears throat> so you could say here he's, he's selling the benefits of, uh, you know, living your soul, feeling your soul, your eternal self. I mean, what I often do is sit and meditate and I'm thinking about rubbish and stuff and I, um, I remind myself, you know, I'm not just a being that lives for a hundred odd years, but I'm a soul and I've been existing for a long time and I'm not going to cease to exist. It just changes your perceptions of things. Sir, the woman said, give me that water, and then I shall not be thirsty, nor have I come all this way to draw. Yeshua replied, go home, call your husband and come back. She answered, I have no husband. You are right, said Yeshua, in saying that you have no husband. For although you have had five husbands, the man whom you are now living is not your husband. You told me the truth there. Sir, she replied, I can see that you are a prophet. So, okay, so he's done his first little miracle, if you like. Well, I'm not saying it's his first, but he's done a little miracle there. Now, he was on his own. He'd been left there on his own. He met this woman. He was getting a feel for her. Um... There are probably people who say this is going to be esoteric. 
that she had five husbands, and maybe it is. Maybe it's a bit of a story. Well, we'll read on and we'll see how it comes out. But, you know, he by doing that, he's he's nailed it on the head with her. You know, maybe he's noticed she hasn't got a... Maybe he can tell, he can get the feeling that she's been with a man, um, but she hasn't got the the sign that of marriage or something. So, you know, using both understanding and feeling, you know, he's and he's gone and hit the nail on the head. I can see you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. Also, he's in quite a special place, you know, so he's... He, those vibes again, thinking that, you know, Jacob's well was there and stuff. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the temple where God should be worshipped is in Jerusalem. Believe me, said Yeshua, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. So, there you go. You don't need to be anywhere specific to worship God. You Samaritans worship without knowing what you, are, what you worship, while we worship what we know. It is from the Jews that salvation comes. But the time approaches indeed, it is already here, when those who are real worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Such are the worshippers whom the Father wants. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So, it's got nothing to do with anything physical. It's heart feeling. The woman answered, I know that Messiah, that is Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will tell us everything. Yeshua said, I am he. I am I who am speaking to you now. <clears throat> I think that's one of the rare times when he actually declares it. You know, but there he is, declaring it to a woman, no one else around. Trying it out. At that moment his disciples returned and were astonished to find him talking with a woman. But none of them said, what do you want, or... Why are you talking with her? The woman put down her water jar and went away to the town, where she said to the people, Come and see a man who has told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. <laughs> Starting to create a, a buzz, eh? It's claimed that he's Messiah. Christ, chosen one, anointed one. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, have something to eat. But he said, I have no food to eat of which you... Sorry. But he said, I have food to eat of which you know nothing. At this, the disciples said to one another, Can someone have brought him food? But Yeshua said, It is meat and drink for me to do the will of him who has sent me until I have finished his work. So, by getting, by doing what he feels is right, that he feels is his path and from God, is actually sustaining him. He's, you know, because, you know, you eat food and then you, you feel like you've accomplished something, you feel now you're settled, you know, now you, you can be fine. But he, he's just getting that, you know, he's just done a little thing there, hasn't he? He's like told the woman he's Messiah, he's picked into something and got it right and you know, and that's that's made him feel great. He doesn't want any food. And he knows that the others can't grasp or get to what what he's experiencing. Do you not say Four months more, and then comes harvest. But look, I tell you, look round on the fields. They are already white, ripe for harvest. The reaper is drawing his pay and gathering a crop for eternal life, 
so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. That is how the saying comes true. One sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap a crop for which you have not toiled. Others toiled, and you have come in for the harvest of their toil. Interesting. He might be saying that, you know, to his disciples, you know, they they are going to reap harvest for stuff that he's toiled before. Many Samaritans of that town came to believe in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Not quite. So when these Samaritans had come to him, they pressed him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more became believers because of what they heard from his own lips. They told the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard him ourselves, and we know that this is in, this in, is in truth the saviour of the world. So he's, well, he's, you know, because he's wise, he's got wisdom. He knows more than them. When the two days were over, he set out for Galilee. For Jesus, uh, Yeshua himself declared that a prophet is without honour in his own country. On his arrival in Galilee, the Galileans gave him a welcome, because they had seen all that he did at the festival in Jerusalem, and they had been at the festival themselves. Once again he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. An officer in the royal service was there, whose son was lying ill at Capernaum. When he heard that Yeshua had come from Judea into Galilee, he came to him and begged him to go down and cure his son, who was at the point of death. Yeshua said to him, Will none of you ever believe without seeing signs and portents? The officer pleaded with him, Sir, come down before my boy dies. Then Yeshua said, Return home, your son will live. The man believed what Yeshua said and started for home. When he was on his way down, his servants met him with the news. Your boy is going to live. So he asked them what time it was when he began to recover. They said, Yesterday at one in the afternoon the fever left him. Right, <clears throat> now we haven't heard about any um, Yeshua healing blind or lame people yet. and Maybe that's, I can't remember if that's coming up. But whenever he healed, he said to them, your faith has healed you. So here comes a Roman up to Yeshua. Probably not, you know, even though Yeshua's saying love your enemies, probably Romans weren't his favourite. So... So they asked him to come and help, and he says, Will none of you ever believe without seeing signs and portents? You know, as if sort of to say, well, you know, the healing is the, is in the belief. You know, in, in, the, in the belief that it will be healed, that God will do it. There's, there's the thing. But you, they're kind of depending on someone else being there and saying, it will be. So he says that, you know, so he's almost reluctant. Please, and then he said, please again. And then and then he's just, look, go home and he will be healed. You know, in a sense, just to give him what he's asked for is that assurance. So he gave him the assurance. And, and he wanted to check, did it work? And I think he might have been quite impressed with the faith of the Roman. Your son will live, and he and his household became believers. This was now the second sign which Yeshua performed after coming down from Judea into Galilee. Later on, Yeshua went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now at the sheep pool in Jerusalem, there is a place with five colonnades. Its name in the language of the Jews is Beth Beth Esther. 
In these colonnades there lay a crowd of sick people, blind, lame and paralysed. Among them was a man who had been crippled for thirty-eight years. When Yeshua saw him lying there and was aware that he had been ill a long time. Right, just, let me just say here. The, the Roman son was healed. Yeshua got confirmation of that. What time? And he asked, what time was it? Yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. So it was a, he had a fever. What time is it? So Yeshua may well have learnt something from that. And then they head, so they perhaps then, purposely, they head for somewhere where they know there's going to be people who are lame and stuff. When Yeshua saw him lying there, he was aware that he had been ill for a long time. He asked him, Do you want to recover? Sir, he replied, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is disturbed, but while I am moving, someone else is in the pool before me. Yeshua answered, Rise up to your feet, take your bed and walk. The man recovered instantly, took up his stretcher and began to walk. <laughs> So, it seems now that Yeshua has learnt how to, in a sense, project his authority. His, his belief uh, has become so strong that he can stand near someone and project it and that they too will have that belief and it works. And it works. So it works. <coughs> that day was a Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been cured, It is the Sabbath. You're not allowed to carry your bed on the Sabbath. He answered, The man who cured me said, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who told, told you to take up your bed and walk? But the cripple who had been cured did not know. For the place was crowded and Yeshua had slipped away. A little later Yeshua found him in the temple and said to him, Now that you are well again, leave your sinful ways, or you may suffer something worse. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Yeshua who had cured him. It was works of this kind done on the Sabbath that stirred the Jews to persecute Yeshua. He defended himself by saying, my father has never yet ceased his work, and I am working too. This made the Jews still more determined to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but by calling God his own father, he claimed equality with God. Well, I don't agree with that. I mean, <laughs> if I'm calling someone my father, I'm not claiming equality, am I? <laughs> it's the opposite. To this charge, Yeshua replied, In truth, in very truth, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. So here he's answering that charge, basically. He's saying, I'm not equal. What the Father does, the Son does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all his works, and will show greater yet, to fill, we to fill you with wonder. As the Father raises the dead and gives them, to gives them life, so the Son gives life to men, as he determines, and again, the Father does not judge anyone, but has given the full jurisdiction to the Son. So he's also saying there, you know, that it was kind of the Father doing the healing, you know, basically the Son just being a conduit. It is his will that all should pay the same honour to the Son as to the Father. To deny honour to the Son is to deny it to the Father who sent him. Yeah. In very truth, anyone who gives heed to what I say and puts his trust in him who sent me has hold of eternal life and does not come up for judgment, but has already passed from death to life. So has already done the judgment. In truth, in very truth, I tell you, a time is coming indeed. It is already here when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, 
and all who hear shall come to life. For as the Father has life-giving power in himself, so has the Son, by the Father's gift. As Son of Man, he has also been given the right to pass judgment. Do not wonder at this, because the time is coming when all who are in the grave shall hear his voice and come out. Those who have done right will rise to life. Those who have done wrong will rise to hear their doom. I cannot act by myself. I judge as I am bidden, and my sentence is just, because my aim is not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So this bit about coming out of their graves, I mean, there's a lot of priests and that who believe this to be uh, literally what's going to happen, you know, that. I asked a vicar, he said, yeah, he believed that when he dies, his body will be underground or whatever until that day when he'll rise up. <laughs> I guess those people aren't up for um, cremation. <laughs> or they would just believe, oh, yeah, I'll come from the dust and bring me up. Anyway, it's not about that. The people who are dead, so th those... Uh, does not come up for judgment, but has already passed from death to life. Um, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, the dead being those who just don't know they've got eternal life. They're the dead, basically. So, most people on the earth today, then, are dead, because they're so concerned with, you know, their, their earthly life, they don't think about or believe much about life after death, so they're, they're dead to their true being. How can you base decisions on what you do every day if you really don't know what you are? That's that. If I testify on my own behalf, that testimony does not hold good. There is another who bears witness for me. And I know that his testimony holds. Your messengers have been to John. You have his testimony to the truth. Not that I rely on human testimony, but I remind you of it for your own salvation. John was a lamp burning brightly, and for a time you were ready to exult in his light. But I rely on a testimony higher than John's. There is enough to testify that the Father has sent me in the works my Father gave me to do and to finish. So, you know, like his healing he's just been doing. The very works I have in hand, this testimony to me was given by the Father who sent me. Although you never heard his voice or saw his form, but his word has found no home in you, for you do not believe the one whom he sent. You study the scriptures diligently, supposing that in having them you have the eternal life. Yet, although their testimony points to me, you refuse to come to me for that life. I do not look to men for honour, but with you it is different, as I know well, for you have no love for God in you. I have come accredited by my Father, and you have no welcome for me. If another comes self-accredited, you will welcome him. How can you have faith so long as you receive honour from one another, and care nothing for the honour that comes from him who alone is God? Do not imagine that I shall be your accuser at the Father's tribunal. Your accuser is Moses, the very Moses on whom you have set your hope. If you believed Moses, you would believe what I tell you, for it was about me that he wrote. But if you do not believe what he wrote, how are you to believe what I say? Okay, so I, I don't know that Moses stuff. Obviously back then in the day, the... You know, the, the scriptures, the main dude was probably Moses. So, there we go. Some time later, Jesus withdrew to the farther shore of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. And a large crowd of people followed who had seen the signs he performed in healing the sick. Then Jesus went up the hillside and sat down with his disciples. It was near the time of Passover the great Jewish festival. That's where they don't eat unleavened bread. Raising his eyes and seeing a large crowd coming towards him, Yeshua said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread to feed these people? This, he said, 
This he said to test him. Yeshua himself knew what he meant to do. Philip replied, Twenty pounds would not buy enough bread for every one of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fishes, but what is that among so many? Yeshua said, Make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass there, so the men sat down, about five thousand of them. Then Yeshua took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to people as they sat there. He did this the same with the fishes, and they had as much as they wanted. When everyone had had enough, he said to the disciples, Collect the pieces left over so that nothing may be lost. This they did, and filled twelve baskets with the pieces left uneaten of the five barley loaves. Now, before I read on, I've never bought this miracle. And something just occurred to me, having read that, is... As they were sharing out their food, there were 5,000 people there. Now, I guess people in those days would have accepted, you know, they might need to bring some lunch with them or something. So was it more of in the act of sharing and not being greedy and not just holding on to what you've got but offering it to others, that that created an environment where people were being generous with what they had? And then they end up with more food left than they started. And in a sense, that's, that's sort of a miracle anyway. When the people saw the sign Yeshua had performed, the word went round. Surely this must be the prophet that was to come into the world. I mean, also another point is, if Yeshua was making a sort of an aura, feeling God and particularly Mother God, I'd say, for the, for the food, and Father God for the, for the thirst, um, you know, people might just not felt as hungry, didn't feel they needed to eat much. Okay. <clears throat> Surely this must be the prophet that was to come into the world. Yeshua, aware that they meant to come and seize him to proclaim him king, withdrew again to the hills by himself. He didn't want that. So he sensed that, you know, they're going to cheer and things. He wanted to get away from that. At nightfall his disciples went down to the sea, got into their boat and pushed off to cross the water to Capernaum. Darkness had already fallen, and Yeshua had not yet joined them. By now a strong wind was blowing, and the sea grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Yeshua walking on the sea and approaching the boat. They were terrified, but he called out, It is I! Do not be afraid! Then they were ready to take him aboard, and immediately the boat reached the land they were making for. So that's, that's just some sort of uh, freak occurrence. I mean, that's, I think it's written differently in, uh, in some of the other books. But again, that's, that's one that I've never bought either. I'm not sure. Have you learnt to windsurf? <laughs> Next morning the crowd was standing on the opposite shore. They had seen only one boat there, and Yeshua they knew had not embarked with his disciples, who had gone away without him. Boats from Tiberias, however, came ashore near the place where the people had eaten the bread over which the Lord gave thanks. When the people saw that neither Yeshua nor his disciples were any longer there, they themselves went aboard these boats and made for Capernaum, in search of Yeshua. They found him on the other side. Rabbi, they said, when did you come here? Yeshua replied, in very truth, I know that you have not come looking for me because you saw signs, but because you ate the bread and your hunger was satisfied. 
You must work not for this perishable food, but for the food that lasts, the food of eternal life. This food the Son of Man will give you, for he, for he it is upon whom God the Father has set the seal of his authority. The, the food the soul will give you, for he it is upon whom God the Father has set the seal of his authority. No, son of man there is not meaning soul, is meaning a chosen one, I think. Then what must we do, they asked him, if we are to work as God would have us work? Yeshua replied, this is the work that God requires, believe in the one whom he has sent. Well, maybe if that was true then, it's true now. <laughs> believe in the one whom he has sent. Okay, we're up to John 6.30, well that was John 6.29, I'm going to take a break. <laughs> 